Good morning. Uh, it's, it's great to be here uh, and to share with you a little bit. And I, and I think um, probably as, as was already said, the, uh, having uh, a patient open this talk maybe will help set the stage for some of the other areas. So uh, as was mentioned, uh, I, I do come from the patient perspective. Of course, many of us in this room are patients. You've, you've heard my CV and my disclosures. I think probably most relevant for today uh, will be the fact that I am a patient uh, representative. I serve on the ICER board, uh, and I do consulting work for a number of the companies, including some of those that are actually going to be uh, on the panel today. So uh, I'm going to use hemophilia as an example. Uh, most of you have probably figured out, uh, if you haven't seen it this week and knew before, that the hemophilia uh, gene therapies are actually getting tantalizingly close. And so now, um, what do we do about that? Uh, hemophilia as a rare disease, about 400,000 individuals worldwide, about 25,000 in the United States, an equal number in Europe. It's a $6 billion market expected to grow to uh, uh, over $10 billion um, by 2027, uh, with gene therapy now making up about 12% of that market. Uh, so uh, an enormous potential, uh, a lot of cost, uh, and, uh, and it already is an expensive drug. So uh, this is data from a European study. I added the U.S. sort of in euros. That would be about 450,000 U.S. for an adult male with severe hemophilia. Um, that's about typical for what my annual drug spend uh, would be. So the question that I always ask, uh, this is actually a quote of mine from a paper published uh, a few years ago um, looking at adaptive licensing, is the safest, most effective drug that nobody's going to pay for or is not available for me, it's absolutely no benefit to me. So the conversation that we're going to have about how do we make it available I think is fundamentally important. And when do we begin that conversation? Uh, I think we all know, uh, whether it's you're reading the popular press or whether you're involved in this space, is real-world data, what happens in the real world, really is fundamentally important. But what you're doing in the clinical trials and the kinds of things that we talk about at this meeting uh, isn't necessarily the real world. It's that pristine clinical trial world where we're trying to uh, figure out what is the right data that we need just to get past the FDA or the EMA to get our ticket uh, to be able to go to market. And I would argue that, uh, that uh, it's too late uh, uh, to begin to think about what you need to collect in the real world if you've not thought about it uh, in the early clinical space. And fundamentally, what uh, we talk about is patient-focused drug development, patient-centered care, relevant patient outcomes. And so engaging patients early and understanding what's important to them, uh, I believe, is a key to success, which is what this meeting's about. Mike Porter. Uh, a Harvard economist has written extensively about this. Um, we hear about value frameworks and uh, a number of the other tools that are being used by health systems today. Uh, he really is sort of the godfather of uh, these kinds of concepts. And what he talks about, I think, with great clarity is that historically the kinds of things that we have collected in clinical trials and in clinical settings are those things that can be easily counted, those things that can be surrogates or metrics, things that we can put a hard number on. Uh, but I, as an individual, as a patient, I spend less than 1% of my time in a clinical setting. And that's where all the data comes from to decide whether uh, a drug or a device or an intervention is actually producing an outcome relevant to me. It's the other 99% of my life that actually makes me who I am as a patient. And so can we find a way to capture and identify patient outcomes that actually capture the whole cycle of life that would truly make a difference uh, in daily living? So the nice thing is uh, we're starting to get a lot of traction about this. The FDA, I think it was part of PDUFA 5, uh, the Patient Focused Drug Development Initiative was actually launched. Uh, as a part of that, they did what they called the Voice of the Patient series. Uh, the Hemophilia Bleeding Disorders Community uh, petitioned to be one of the original 20 groups uh, that uh, uh, was able to go through the program. Uh, and we did, and so what you actually see here on the screen is sort of the summary of that report, and, and I really like, I think it's about the last sentences of, of the report, is the FDA acknowledges the enormous advances. My life expectancy when I was born was around 20. Um, today I'm looking at being cured. Remarkable advances, but there still are enormous economic, social, and educational barriers that remain for people, whether you're living with hemophilia, a chronic hereditary disease, or another disease. And so we asked patients, and we were able to report, and the FDA acknowledged and, uh, and took note, that pain, chronic pain, not one of the core metrics that we measure in clinical trials or in clinical settings, the anxiety, the depression, um, are, are, are acute uh, within our patient population, as well as many of the other things that I've talked about. 
So as we begin to think about what could gene therapy or curative technology deliver for our patient population, certainly the transformative effect of being cured of a lifelong disease could go a long way in eliminating anxiety and depression and certainly a heading off the, uh, the joint pain that comes from the chronic arthropathy of bleeding into the joints uh, that is a, a manifestation of living with hemophilia. So ICER, as I mentioned, I joined the ICER board this year, um, not necessarily with trepidation, but, but recognizing that uh, we've got to figure out how to get these paid for. And although many of us probably are not a fan of qualities and uh, sort of the whole value process, I think it is important to recognize that it is the, it, it is the game. Uh, it's the way world, uh, excuse me, most of the world operates. It's the way organizations like NICE in the UK or Cadeth in Canada uh, and others across Europe actually operate. And so we're a little bit foolish if we don't think that's the case here. But we don't have the data. And I think that's really what he's saying is um, that we come to trial, we come to the ISA reviews, and you read one of the reports and it says, you know, it'll acknowledge that there are important contextual outcomes, but it says data not available. And so they can't begin to think about including it in the model. So why isn't that data available? Did the company not take the time to think about what's important to the patients and collect that data and then actually bridge the clinical development and then the commercialization of the product? Now, fortunate for us, I come from the hemophilia community, um, uh, ISA recognizes that we're sort of light years ahead of many of the other disease groups, and uh, they actually acknowledge that you know, patients are going to be part of help filling that gap in that equation. So uh, this is from an ISA report recently. They actually reviewed a hemophilia drug. Uh, and uh, uh, so this was a drug to deal with uh, inhibitors, inhibitory, those that have inhibitory antibodies to the current standard of care, not gene therapy. But I think uh, it's a great roadmap for those of you that are working in this space. Read the report, and I think you'll understand the kind of direction where ICER is open to going, uh, although maybe we aren't going to get there and maybe it's not going to be perfect. But there is certainly room to assess the value of all these other contextual value, um, uh, factors as we think about cost-effective analysis. But they really need to be related to what's important to the patient. So as I think about the data collection, I don't think it is, as the typical um, binary process of what you need to do to get market authorization and then what do you need for market access, but I really think of a continuum of data collection that really spans beyond market access. So thinking about what can you collect um, early for market authorization, what of that data may be a subset or it's part of a, a larger part that's going to be important for market access. And then even more important, when it gets to the clinic near me and I'm sitting down and making a decision with my doc, I actually want to be able to compare and contrast and understand what this drug's going to do for me. So it really serves the entire span. But really building that consistent data collection plan starts uh, not long after the, the translational science and sort of day one is developed. So within the hemophilia space, we actually wanted to see if we could do that, if we could help inform uh, the community and all of the relevant stakeholders. I had a poster on it earlier this week. We've published a couple publications. But we actually wanted to see if we could design a core outcome project where if we could have patients, clinicians, researchers, companies, uh, regulators and health technology agencies uh, all sit down together and we did that so we had the top authorities in the EMA and the FDA we had I think about the six largest US payers we had Cadeth, NICE, ICER uh, as well as leading patient organizations all of the hemophilia companies excuse me gene therapy companies in the hemophilia space participated we went through an extended process to agree on a core set of outcomes that we think might serve that continuing arc and so we identify what I really think sort of are six. Uh, core outcome sets are typically six. There's a methodology for this. Frequency of bleeding and factor activity level, typical clinical metrics that would be tracked today, but maybe don't directly relate to how I think about I certainly don't talk to my buddies. You know, how many bleeds did you have last year? We talk about the same things that, that you talk about. What did you do this weekend? Where are you going to school? You know, how's work going? Um, but then uh, chronic pain and the mental health, the kinds of things that we identified through our FDA process that are really very patient-centric. And then certainly payers uh, and, and, and all of this as well. But I, you know, I do care about how long it's going to work. And, and payers certainly care about the cost and the cost offset. So maybe we're fortunate in hemophilia that we actually have a cost offset. But, um, uh, but it may well not be uh, dollar for dollar. And then there were others identified. So this is published in hemophilia. If you just um, look up core heme and hemophilia, you'll see the whole methodology uh, for this. And I'd be happy to discuss it. 
So my takeaway for this introduction really is that uh, as you're beginning to think about your clinical development programs, um, don't just leave it to the commercialization team to think about it at the end. The takeaway really is that patients need to be moved from being patients as subjects of clinical studies uh, to being active partners uh, in the process. Thank you.